Hello, welcome to the last of our uh, question and answer sessions. Today we have four questions and I'll read them in order. Here's the first one. I would like to understand the difference between thinking and feeling. My subjective experience tells me that there are times when I'm simply thinking. At other times I'm feeling an emotion. Sometimes for no reason. At other times the reason is obvious. But either way, I then begin to think about the feeling. Thinking and feeling are obviously very interconnected, but which comes first? If feeling precedes thinking, is that always the case? So, um, I like this question because the distinction between thinking and feeling is an absolutely fundamental distinction in, re in relation to the uh, stuff of the mind. Um, and if you think back over the last uh, week's lessons, one of the themes that I've tried to develop is the idea that feelings represent problems, they represent needs, they represent demands upon the mind to perform work. Feelings make us aware that something uh, unexpected or something unpredicted or something unsolved um, is occurring. And when I say that feelings represent demands upon the mind to perform work, what I really mean is that they represent demands on thinking. The mind, in this colloquial sense that I'm using, it really should be said, it should be translated as thinking. So, to come to the question, in the um, ideal case, uh, in the standard situation, feelings come first and thoughts are ways of dealing with the feelings ways of, as it were, thinking our way out of the feelings, uh, finding a solution that meets the need that lies behind the feeling. Um, I say they come first um, in the hierarchical or developmental sense, in that first we have feelings. A little neonate has no thoughts uh, to speak of, and the thinking apparatus, the, the, the um, material that we internalize, the the, the, the solutions that we've experienced, um, the experience we've had of how to meet our needs in the world, this is the thinking apparatus which then gradually develops on top of those feelings. Once that's happened though, thinking can become very elaborate. And um, to mention just the most obvious case, um, a thought can be rethought. Something that, a thought that has been developed in relation to a, picu a particular feeling if that thought is activate, activated from above, as it were, that will in turn reactivate the feeling that goes with it, especially if it's a thought, and, and, and this is important, especially if it's a thought, uh, that is to say a mental ideational process, which has not properly mastered the feeling in question. That will reactivate the feeling. Um, you must remember that thoughts, representational cognitions, are just an internalization of our perceptions of the world. All thought as distinct from feeling. All thought has a perceptual form and is derived ultimately from external perception. It's an internalization of our experience of the world, what Freud called the reality principle. So uh, when we uh, feeling our way through our thoughts, we are, as it were, feeling our way through a virtual reality, feeling our way through representations of reality, and the function of thought is to stand for reality. It's a, it's a virtual space in our minds in which we can work out in the safety of our minds what to do uh, in relation to reality before we actually put our thoughts into effect. So there's an important overlap between the concept of thinking and the concept of doing in the world. One consequence of this, just to again try to elaborate a bit on the question that's being asked, is that we might, in our doings in the world, avoid certain situations, certain places, for example, uh, um, cliff faces, for example, because they make us feel something untoward. In this case, fear. I don't go there because I know if I go there, I'm going to feel scared. That's why I don't go there. That's what the thought, that's the thought doing the work that it's meant to. It, 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 it guides your actions uh, in relation to the feelings um, that arise. And you'll notice that in this case, there's a not doing a certain type of thing in order to prevent a certain feeling from occurring. And that can also happen purely in the virtual reality of thinking as opposed to actual external world of doing. So that we might avoid certain sorts of thoughts 
because those thoughts evoke feelings um, that we find unpleasant. Um, and that's how one of the ways in which uh, one might develop, for example, a phobia. Um, and there are all sorts of complicated mental gymnastics that we get up to um, on the basis of the model that I've just described. So, to come back to the question, yes, feelings come first, thoughts develop in order for us to manage our feelings, um, but once the thoughts have developed, then you also have top-down processes which, um, in their regulating of feelings, um, make the feelings come second, but that's only in this derivative sense, once there's a, once there's a more mature apparatus. One last footnote to this um, answer is that I see the way that I've um, spoken might give the false impression that feelings, um, the feelings I'm talking about are only bad feelings when I say one avoids a certain thought because it might give rise to anxiety. Um, one might also indulge in a certain thought because it gives rise to pleasure. Um, but there too, um, you know, the, the, the distinction between thinking and doing is very important. The indulging in a certain kind of thought because it gives pleasure may be another way of avoiding reality. For example, the fear of putting that thought uh, into action. So avoiding reality and, and living in a world of fantasy, um, the, that case is covered by the same sort of reasoning as, um, as I've just um, uh, explicated. Hope that's clear. <laughs>